Welcome to Progenesis Academy webinar number 16. Today's topic is five minutes laboratory IVF lab tour, an inside view of the best IVF practices. Um, we are very pleased to welcome five IVF lab experts. We have with us Bill Vinier. He is an IVF lab director at San Diego Fertility Center. We have Sharon Anderson. She is the scientific director um, an IVF laboratory director at Mainline Fertility. <coughs> we have Brian Lomanto, his logistic director and laboratory manager at the World Egg Bank. And we have Tony Anderson, um, lab director at Aspire Fertility Centers. And we have Christine Ivani, IVF lab director at Reproductive Science Center of the San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today, we're going to be covering five topics, ICSI versus IVF, sperm isolation with cymotechnology, cryopreservation, biopsy versus flicking, and embryo selection with artificial intelligence. And uh, we will start with Bill Vinier, ICSI versus IVF. Bill, the floor is yours. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Welcome to the San Diego Fertility Center IVF lab. Okay, so we use workstations with uh, heated stages, microscopes, and monitors. So we don't have an electronic uh, ID system, so we use each other. Uh, we have three full micro manipulation setups with lasers. We use bench top Labotech incubators. And uh, here's the size of our lab with all the workstations, incubators, and some cryo storage tanks. The ones that are under the counter here are working ones, so they're not full. And then these are the latest to be filled. We also have a planar incubator that we uh, use for our FETs, our sperm pepper area, some more workstations for tubing, freezing and thawing, and a dish prep area. One last spot. I know I'm just over a minute, but then we have more cryo storage here. Um, but we have mo the majority of our tanks next door, but we can't wait to start using this puppy soon. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes, um, Great. All right, so I uh, thanks uh, Nabil for uh, inviting me into this with this esteemed panel of, of people. It's greatly appreciated. I'm humbled by, uh, by the invitation. Um, so I get to cover IVF by ICSI, and I wasn't sure how to handle this one because uh, you can go to the next slide. There is my disclosure. So it's kind of tough. I'm a little bit biased. Um, so I'm gonna show some slides uh, that kind of cover, um, you know, not really pros and cons of both, but different uh, papers that have come out on either side of the fence. So uh, you, that's uh, our wonderful puppy um, in the far left corner. So you can then say hi to Barkley. So you gotta figure out again, what's best for your practice what's best for the embryology team as far as fertilization rates, what's best for your clinic, uh, pregnancy rates, because that's what the docs want and the public wants. So again, the patients want a healthy baby, but are the techniques we use, uh, are they safe? So next slide. Um, diagnosis, these are the kind of the main ones that would probably um, kind of determine whether you're gonna use IVF or ICSI and whether you use ICSI for non-male factor patients or not, um, those are things that you, you must consider. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, here's our experience and that's why we're 100% ICSI. So ICSI just works better in our lab. So it would be like um, Ben Franklin, Thomas Edison, you know, Ben with his kite and his key, Thomas Edison with the light bulb. I mean, here are great inventions. So great minds make great inventions, right? Well, great minds make great mistakes also. So thanks to Dr. Palamo for making a mistake 
and introducing ICSI to uh, the IVF field. Next slide. This is just two different uh, papers or, or tables. Uh, the top one shows that there is a difference between IVF insemination versus ICSI uh, as far as blastocyst development, but not necessarily fertilization and live birth rates. The bottom one does show a significant difference um, in fertilization rates in, in a unexplained infertility group, uh, but no difference in a uh, subfertility uh, borderline sperm group. Next slide. Again, two different papers. The first one is pre-ICSI, so 16% of total fertilization failure were observed with IVF, and that doubled in moderate to severe defective sperm, right? And then after ICSI, failed fertilization actually went down in regular IVF. That's because more people started using ICSI for male factor patients. However, you can still get no FERT with ICSI. And um, I've had it before. So uh, it, it's, it's not fun, but um, I'd rather use ICSI over IVF because there's less chance of that occurring. Next slide, please. Again, two different papers, um, just associating kind of the safety of ICSI uh, itself, which everyone, um, at least early on, had questions about. I don't, I don't think those questions are really around anymore, uh, especially with patients. Um, all of them accept that we're doing ICSI. It's very rare for us to do IVF. So um, it just shows that, hey, there is some difference there, but there is no difference between ICSI and IVF. Uh, and the bottom one shows um, where those abnormalities are coming from. So that's what we're probably doing is we're passing on the subfertile population. So it's not necessarily the technique, it's the genetic, genetics behind the individuals that we're working with. Next slide. So my last slide here is kind of two things that you need to consider and it's kind of um, contradictory of us using 100% uh, ICSI, but Kim Pomeroy and Klaus Wiemer had a great um, discussion on one of the webinars on should we be breaching the zona during COVID. Uh, Klaus did a lot of work in the cattle model with, um, you know, uh, different uh, viruses and bacteria penetrating uh, an open zona and getting and affecting embryo development. So, um, but again, we don't know much too much about COVID. Uh, should be, and, and it's been brought up before, so I don't want to um, beat a dead horse, but, um, you know, should we be keeping cryopreservation separate and those types of things, but we do not do it for the regular flu or in, you know, along those lines. And that last statement there, that just came out. So the egg does not always agree with the women's choice of partner. The researchers found out that the eggs did not always attract more sperm from their partner compared to sperm from another male. So with ICSI, are we forcing fertilization on eggs that don't want to be fertilized with that sperm? So just something to think about. And uh, hopefully I stayed within my uh, time restraints. And uh, I'm looking forward to questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next speaker would be Sharon. Hi, my name is Sharon Anderson. I'm the lab director here at the Mainline Fertility Center. And today I'm going to give you a behind the scenes tour of our IVF lab. These are our 12 incubators. We do individual embryo culture here. These are low oxygen and IR censored incubators. This is our main hood where we do our egg retrieval procedures. There's the pass-through window into our Class C operating room. Of course, where the physicians retrieve the eggs. Back here, we have a vitrification station. This hood back here, we use to air out our supplies, make our dishes, 
can also do our tubing for PGT. This is our lineup here of our micro manipulators. This is where we do the ICSI and also the trifectoderm biopsies for PGT. This hood over here on the left, this is our main embryo transfer hood. So the embryos are loaded into the catheters. The catheters pass through this window into our embryo transfer room. So this concludes your behind the scenes tour of the Mainline Fertility Embryology Lab. Thank you. Hi, so um, can you hear me okay? You can hear me? Okay. So today I'm going to talk about the uh, Zymo sperm separation device. Um, I work at the Mainline Fertility Center. It's in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, which is near Philadelphia. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our center. It's uh, relatively new, uh, built back in 2013-2014. Uh, Next slide. And we are a, uh, we have our own surgical center. Um, and then of course, uh, the, IV, the IVF labs. Just some pictures kind of behind the scenes. Next slide, please. So the Zymote is a sperm separation device and it is FDA cleared and it is CE certified. What we really like about it is that um, centrifugation is, is not necessary. Um, it seems to be a, a more gentler uh, type of um, way to obtain sperm for IVF and ICSI. And um, it's only a 30 minute incubation. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go over the Zymote in 10 very easy steps. The first one is you just incubate the sperm for about 30 minutes to liquefy. And then at mainline, we do uh, a semen analysis. Uh, we have a Hamilton Thorne uh, Cirrhosis machine. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, you know, kind of what they look like uh, when you open the box and you want to just aseptically open the package in a hood. And um, on the right hand side, this is what the device looks like close up. Next slide, please. So the first thing you do is you just use a one mil syringe and you add 850 microliters of semen uh, uh, to the port. If you have um, a volume of semen that's less than 850 microliters, you wanna bring the volume up to 850 or around a milliliter. Uh, you can use your sperm washing medium or you can use uh, your fertilization medium. We like to keep some of the sample, some of the semen sample um, in a test tube. We don't wanna load the whole thing um, just in case, just in case, uh, you know, we don't get any sperm to swim through the, through the device. We can always, we can always do um, ICSI. Next slide, please. A lot of people say, can you use it with, with, a, with a frozen sample? Um, yes, and uh, the company, they recommend that you extend the uh, frozen sample one-to-one -one with medium before you add it to the device. Next slide. So the next step would be um, after you add the, um, the semen to the one port, you wanna add about 750 microliters um, above the membrane. Um, they now recommend that you kind of prime it uh, with 50 microliters in that outer port. And you wanna make sure that you fill the channel and slightly uh, spill into the chamber just so um, there's a nice easy path, uh, path for the sperm. Then you wanna uh, incubate the device for 30 minutes at 37 degrees. It's nice to put it inside a Petri dish um, so you can handle it easier. Next slide, please. Then after about a half hour, um, actually it's supposed to be exactly a half hour is what they tell you, 
you use a fresh one mil syringe and you aspirate um, 500 microliter suspension from that upper chamber through that outer port. Next slide, please. You take that and you can add it to uh, a labeled cap tube. You can use the uh, blue top 15 mil centrifuge tube or you can use the snap top round bottom tubes. And then finally, you just do a semen analysis and then you're ready to go either for standard insemination or for ICSI. And in conclusion, we at, um, at our center, you know, the embryologists, we, we, we like using this device. Um, again, we're avoiding the centrifugation and there are, uh, you know, some publications out there that report that the selected sperm have uh, less DNA fragmentation. It's very simple, it's easy to use. Um, we haven't done this yet, but you could actually um, also use it for your IUIs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next speaker is gonna be Brian. Brian? Hello, thanks for joining us today at the lab here at the World Egg Bank. Uh, seeing as we are a bank, I wanted to show you our cryo area first. Um, we have a dual monitoring system here. The first on the left there is the CryoSave Sensophone Express 2, which is an internal temperature monitor. And then to the right there we have the CryoSentinel, which is an infrared uh, system and that monitors exterior temperature of the tanks. And here are some of our tanks. And we'll move into the lab here. So our gas is coming through the wall. Got our incubators there. This is our cryo station here. Uh, everything gets vitrified on this, uh, on this table here. Air purification. We have our manipulator set up so we can take pictures and we do make embryos. So we do those there as well. And then our retrieval station. Is a very quick tour of our lab. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Brian, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. All right. So uh, first, I'd like to thank Progenesis for creating this forum and for inviting me to be a part of it today. I am Brian Lavanto. I'm the lab supervisor here at the uh, World Egg Bank. Uh, so I'm going to discuss briefly uh, cryopreservation in-house versus uh, manufactured solutions. Uh, next slide, please. So when thinking about using a manufactured cryopreservation solution versus one prepared in-house, uh, in the interest of brevity, brevity, I'm going to examine only what I deemed to be the most critical procedural elements. Uh, we'll do that so that you can make your own decisions from there based on your individual uh, lab's needs and available resources. So first and foremost is the standard, standardization of constituents. Manufacturers have very precise methods for measurement, ensuring lot-to-lot -lot consistency, and they also must follow stringent regulatory controls governing their manufacturing process. Uh, therefore, controls throughout the pro their process occur with a level of precision that's not so easily reached when preparing media in our labs. It makes manufactured media more predictable with respect to solute concentrations. Solutions made in-house can be subject to increased variability based on factors such as the balancer pipette calibrations, technician competence with the level of precision required, uh, among others. However, with properly trained staff and well-maintained equipment, this can be overcome. So next we have quality assurance testing with each lot. Uh, QA testing, as we see on our certificates, it's multifaceted. So first there's bacterial and fungal testing. The agar plate requirements for bacterial testing alone can vary based on the type of bacteria being tested for. You could use selective or differ differential growth media. Then there are also biochemical tests as well, gram staining, catalase test, substrate utilization tests, 
fungi require different substrates to test for their presence altogether. So this type of testing, it, it's definitely critical for formulating an effective, high quality medium and it requires time and resources to accomplish in-house. Endotoxin level testing is another type of QA procedure that's standard for manufactured media and should also be required for any in-house production. The most common method is the LAL or the Limulus amoebocyte lysate assay. It's highly sensitive for endotoxin levels. Availability to do this test or any other sensitive measure uh, of endotoxin testing may not be readily available in your lab, which would then require sending out a sample of media to a reference lab. Next is the good old fashioned bioassay. Most of us equate that with the mouse blast development or sperm survival. This is pretty straightforward to perform in house and it's also completed by media manufacturers. The last aspect of QA testing um, is pH and osmolality. Uh, these are critical factors that cannot be overlooked. Most of us have a pH meter, but most of us don't have access to an osmometer. Investment in equipment is a factor when deciding whether to formulate your own solutions. Also, all pH meters are not created the same. The meter used uh, for this task should be high quality and reliable. The last and some might say the most important aspect to consider when deciding to manufacture media in-house or to purchase through a commercial supplier is the staff who you will be using as your alchemists. Increasingly in today's IVF lab, time is a factor for everyone. Properly formulating and testing a critical solution such as cryopreservation media requires time, resources, and training. Does your facility have a highly trained individual capable of accomplishing this procedure? with what should amount to good manufacturing practice? Do they have the time available in their busy schedule of day-to-day -day IVF? Do they have adequate resources, such as high-quality chemicals, purified water systems, osmometers, and bioassay materials to produce a high-quality finished product? And then there's other questions that you can come up with to determine if in-house media production would be right for your lab. If the answer to any of these questions is not a response conducive to a quality product, Producing your own media may not be the right fit. In the end, the decision to use in-house versus manufactured media is a decision each individual lab should make based partially on the factors that I've just discussed, but also on factors unique to your lab. In our lab, we use commercial media mostly based on staff time. It's become unnecessary for us to formulate a potentially variable media when there are high quality, viable, and more importantly, familiar options not only for us, but for our partner clinic, clinics warming our eggs. This is just a small sna snapshot to consider uh, in this decision, but what I feel to be the more important ones. So thanks, for, thanks for your time, thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Tony. He will be talking about biopsy and flicking after the video. Hello everybody, this is Tony Anderson. We're from San Antonio, Texas at our Aspire Fertility Lab. I'm going to do you, give you a little 60-minute tour of the laboratory. Um, you'll notice a few things that we do not have uh, laminar flow on many of our hoods. Uh, even if we do have laminar flow on top, we don't run them. Um, just a simple stereoscope for a retrieval area. Also, with each micro station, we have a stereoscope. Notice over here on the left, we actually have some uh, benchtop incubators. Um, wasn't a fan when they first came out, but uh, today I say you get more incubator space per square inch with the bench top, and they do a great job. I um, have another micro station here on the left with a, naturally a stereoscope. This is my training area where I have uh, two micro stations where we also use it for clinical, um, conveniently located six feet apart for good proper social distancing. Um, use it for vitrification, micro, ICSI, biopsy, and uh, thank you for watching. Everybody, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Nabil and uh, Progenesis for, for the invitation. So uh, we'll go to the next slide if we could, please. Um, Typically, I started, I started doing uh, blastocyst biopsies back in the whole genome am amplification days where uh, working with Dagan Wells and um, sending off samples to try it out, did some early single gene cases in the 
uh, at late 90s, early 2000s. And before even lasers were used, I used a knife. And uh, the lasers actually proved to be very successful, kind of doing the typical W or V shape going through here. I use this video for my training, uh, mostly because it's a great example of how you have to get into some fresh tissue each time and get into here and it finally comes off. Uh, one of my concerns was that we were using the laser too much. I know some laboratories have requirements to only hit it three times. Uh, there was a great presentation at ABD last year that where uh, they took us embryos and hit them like two or three times and then five times and 10 times and 20 times and reevaluated those embryos using um, PGT. And all every time the results came out the same. Um, I use this to kind of just also just show what the sizes are. We could go to the next slide, please. So, uh, a one, uh, my, my concern was was the uh, the day six biopsies. We noticed that the day sixes tend to be a little harder to biopsy. Having used the laser a little more, um, there didn't seem to be any differences in the euploidy rates between day five and day six. Uh, we don't do any day seven in our program, but one of my questions was, are we increasing the mosaicism? And I've been doing this, the, I call it snap biopsy or the flick biopsy for a little over two years and just submitted uh, some data to ASRM um, for an abstract this year. And uh, We'll go to the next slide and look at some of that data. So what I did was I looked at, um, at the, uh, using Three different lasers. We have a Xylos, or two different lasers. We have a Xylos and Octax, and doing the uh, SNAP biopsy. Um, I've since also added the uh, um, the Saturn V uh, laser, and not really seeing anything with that, because um, I wanted to know where different people or different embryologists having different euploidy rates, different no re rates, and mosaicism rates. And you can see here, there's really no difference in euploidy depending on what we had. Early on, after the first year of looking at it, I noticed my pregnancy rates were a lot higher than the other um, uh, technicians in my lab. And I thought it was the SNAP biopsy, but it was probably more along the lines of my cryopreservation technique. Um, and so we altered some of our cryopreservation techniques and everything is normalized over that. So, um, and you can see here, there's uh, really not any difference in the amp no amplification rates other than the SNAP biopsy is showing a, a little bit lower. And so that being said, um, you know, it's a trend to lower, no, lower pregnancy. It's a great alternative for uh, the laser. If you didn't have a laser, your laser breaks down. I'm going to show you what that looks like in the next slide. If you would go through it. And so really what it is, I started doing this based on um, Jock. Cohen had asked me to review some, some PG, uh, some biopsy methods. And I saw this and I'm like, I gotta go try it. So I started doing it a couple years ago and actually really like it. I haven't uh, used a laser for biopsy in some time. And in fact, I was trying not to do my, I, we actually do laser assisted hatching on day three. Um, and I would like to just not do any hatching personally. And so that's really just popping it off there. And Riley, if you could start that over, a lot of people want to see that again, and I'll describe what, what I'm doing here. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm focusing on my, uh, my holding pipette. Um, if you look at, if you were to took the timing on these videos, the timing for the laser is about a minute and a half. This process only takes about 30 seconds. So you're really doing it a, very fast. So you focus on that edge of the, of the holding pipette, you get some tension on your uh, on your biopsy needle. And a lot of people are afraid they're going to break their needle. It's, uh, I've never broken one yet. You get some tension on it. You pull down on your on your biopsy side and just pop it off of there, and it breaks off and release it out. Um, that's that's really pretty much it. So we'll go to the next slide if we could. So uh, I want to thank you. And if you uh, want to get in touch with me, here's my email. And um, happy to help you get your uh, SNAP biopsies going. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Kristen, and she's be she's going to be presenting on embryo selection with 
artificial intelligence after the video. Thank you. Let's take a quick one minute tour through the IVF lab at RMC. One important thing to note is you can visit 10 IVF centers and find 10 right ways to do IVF. Our lab is divided into work areas, the first of which is the OR with a pass-through window between the operating room and the IVF lab. There's a foot in there to do retrievals, or we can do the retrieval right here. Next up is the first of three micromanipulator stations. We use the micromanipulator for ICSI, assisted hatching, embryo biopsy, and embryo evaluation. We swing around to the andrology area where sperm samples are prepped for our IVF patients. There are two embryo transfer rooms adjacent to the IDF lab with a workstation in between. This is the second micromanipulator station with its adjacent hood. We're going to swing around this bank of incubators and find a third micromanipulator station. And finally, a work area for the cryopreservation and warming of eggs and embryos. And there you have it. Okay, can you hear me okay? Okay, well, thanks Nabil and the Progenesis team for the kind invitation to join this esteemed panel. Um, today, we're not gonna talk about the type of AI on the left that many of us learned in a world long ago and far, far away. We're gonna focus on the type of AI at the right, artificial intelligence, where we are trying to replicate human intelligence with machines. Now, all of you know we could spend days talking about this, but we have four and a half minutes. So I'm going to talk briefly about a tool that was introduced by Dr. Alexi Barash, who's there on the left. That's me on the right. Um, my disclosure is that Alex knows way, way, way more about this than I will ever know in my lifetime. So I take no credit for this. I give it completely to him. Next slide, please. So we are all becoming more and more aware of uses for AI in the IVF lab, predicting success, predicting cryo survival, laboratory performance, semen analysis, and potentially even patient dropout from cycles. Next slide. So Alex designed uh, what we call a PGT calculator and he used um, over 350 different fields, um, about 175 clinical and about 150 um, morph morphological and kinetic fields, looking at 3,000 cycles that we performed here at RSC and now compiled over a million data points with 150,000 um, process formulas going on in real time. Next slide. So using this PGT calculator, um, we are able to tell a patient what your expected ongoing pregnancy rate might be from a given embryo. How many euploid embryos can I expect from my cycle? How many cycles do I need to do to get one euploid embryo based on my age? And how many eggs or cycles might be needed to get X number of euploid embryos for the purpose of getting siblings, et cetera? And one of the most important things is for setting correct patient expectations. Next slide. So in this first calculator, um, what is my chance of pregnancy or which embryo am I going to pick? So you have the option of selecting age in a drop down menu. I put zero here because we know from our data analysis that um, age becomes irrelevant when we're selecting PGT embryos. So for this particular patient, the embryo is biopsied on day five. She has one embryo for transfer, and the embryo is a grade 4AB using the Gardner scale. So I know we have 82 FETs in the database, 64 IUPs, and that comes out to an 84% pregnancy rate for that particular embryo. On the next slide. So how many euploid embryos can I expect? Again, I put my age in here, 38 years old. I was at one point a long time ago. Um, I got 12 eggs. And from that, using our data, we can expect uh, 1.64 euploid embryos from that particular cycle. In the next slide. How many cycles do I need to get one euploid embryo? This is great when the patient who's 44 comes in saying, I feel like I'm 29. And, um, but she is 44, ovaries are 44, we get five eggs, 
And unfortunately, it's going to take her using this calculator eight IVF cycles to get one euploid embryo. Next slide. So Alex has um, termed this the repro score, and he designed this other tool using all of these fields and calculations with machine learning to look at a patient's individual set of embryos and be able to predict which embryo would be the highest pregnancy rate for that particular patient. So in the search bar, you're gonna put in the patient's medical record number, which we call the MPI for our EMR, and it has been whited out on the left-hand side. So this particular patient has two embryos from a retrieval date of October 13th, 2018. She has a day five, three BB, and a day six, five AA, both are female. And um, she's trying to decide which embryo to transfer. So one might be inclined to pick the higher quality embryo, but we know that from our data analysis that day five is probably over day six is the biggest determining factor for success for us. So the repro score comes out at 74% chance of pregnancy. She did in fact um, have a successful pregnancy and a delivery. For us, this would be a no-brainer because we would pick the day five embryo anyway. But in the next slide, in the second example, this patient has a number of embryos of varying qualities, day of biopsy. Um, again, we, we chose the 3AB, embryo number three, which was a female, at about a 91% chance of pregnancy. She also did in fact become pregnant and deliver a baby. One of the most important things that I'm pointing at my screen, which is stupid because you can't see it, but um, is that even the aneuploid embryos have a high chance of implantation. So we do a lot of PGT in our center and this uh, does help us to select the embryos. Next slide. So the future of artificial intelligence in the lab can be used to predict patient income. It does require obviously data security. It needs to be accurate. It needs to be low cost, it needs to be easy to use, and it needs to be trainable or flexible, meaning that it needs to grow with you. And we have found a way in our laboratory to use such a tool that really helps patients. It makes it easy for the clinician to have a discussion with the patient and to set realistic expectations. Next slide. Thank you, wear your mask. Thank you so much. Very good. Well, thanks everybody for the presentation and for the tour. It was really fun to see every love that we never have a chance to see. Um, I'm going to open a question. We have some questions from the audience, but I'm going to open a question for you guys. Um, how do you feel looking at all the videos? Do you see something that you would implement or something that uh, you would like to see in your lab? And I'm, this is an open question for anyone to take. I think they're all pretty similar from what I could see. Um, I think actually, Tony, you probably have the biggest difference without using flow hoods. And I saw a question come up uh, during that talk and how people, you know, how do people feel? Are we just using flow hoods just because we're comfortable and they've been around forever or do you know? Do we actually really need them if we have a clean air environment to begin with? Sure, uh, Tony. What's the argument? Um, you know, flow hoods. Are, you know, if you have good air, just like you're saying, Bill, and we have a, we have a really nice air handling system. Um, it doesn't work all the time, so I I question some of my air things all the time, but. Um, I stopped using laminar flow um, probably almost 15 years ago. Um, it was noisy in the lab. It was, I think, I think that's probably why I can't hear because of those big giant baker hoods we used to have in our lab. And, um, and I haven't noticed anything. I've never had any trouble with, uh, with uh, contamination from PGT. Um, started out concerned with it with single gene testing years ago with people. Um, uh, PCR and not had any trouble. So, so now I actually don't actually use those. You can save a lot of money with that. And, you, know, you know, that station in my hood, in my training lab was 
uh, $30,000 for both microscopes, both uh, a dual station like that, you'll spend that alone on a hood. I think the key is actually working on your good air in your lab, but really focusing on the simple stuff, pH, osmolarity, and temperature. Once you have those things right, then you'll be good. Very good. Um, let's uh, get to the questions. I think we have three questions from the on the panel. Miriam, can you read one of the questions for us? Sure. Uh, we have a question from Kim asking, what do you think are the causes of no amplification in CBT? That I think it was directed to one specific. Uh... It was directed to Tony. Okay. Um, maybe we can make it as an open question for anyone to comment on it. Uh, Tony, you want to start? I actually couldn't hear. Could she repeat the question? Yes. Uh, she said, what's the source of uh, no amplification uh, in a PGTA? Uh, well, that could be a source from anywhere. Um, one, you didn't get the cell in there. You know, it, you know, you have to hit your, what your KPI, what your uh, no read rates are. Um, and when I see my node read rates going up, um, I've had it as high as 7%. Uh, with some uh, with uh, genomics companies and um, so you know we all want to blame it on the genomics company I'm not saying that that's the case um, I've had people come for training just because they do have a high uh, no read rate looking at that um, you know how do you store those cells you know you really need to have been a minus 20 freezer where it doesn't it's a frost free freezer if you're not shipping them out all the time um, you know, so, and, you know, shipping from here in Texas where it's, you know, 100 degrees every day, we want to make sure we keep those cold packs ready to go all the time. So at, at our rate at around 2.2%, a little under 2% actually overall, um, I'm, I'm okay with that. I heard Mandy Katz Jaffrey say 4%, so. It may be uh, where you put it in the tube also. Uh, we had some issues with uh, one tech uh, that did have a higher um, no result rate than other people. So um, we kind of looked at it and she was setting it a little bit too high. She was, you know, in the bottom of that tube, but uh, not just not far down enough. And even though they spin it down. We, uh, we corrected that. But, uh, you know, even though you, that is being spun down too, right? I mean, the genomics companies do spin that down. So whether that just gets adhered to the, to the upper level and never makes it down to uh, where it needs to be. Any other comments? I think Tony made a lot of really good points um, and, and Bill's comment also about where you put it in the tube. It does require a lot of practice and um, our no call rate is, is quite low. It's less than 1%. We try to use a minimal number of labs, which I think simplifies things. And when people are training, we um, will send a number of samples to the lab just for checking before we leave, release somebody to do the work on their own. But it, it's still when it does, it does happen. And I think sometimes it is degraded DNA. I think it can be patient age. It can be the quality of the cells, not necessarily related to the operator. Um, it can also be the the genetics lab, but I think we're never going to be at zero. We're just never going to be at zero. And so we need to leave ourselves the opportunity to, to re-biopsy that embryo if we have to. Very good. Embryo we... quality you start with as well. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, Miriam, can you take the next question? Uh, next question is also for Tony. Um, Al asks, did you notice an increased number of cells biopsied with the flick method? And do you have any mosaic results with this method? Uh, can, you, can you read that one more time? Um, it's, it's hard to, to hear you. Yes. Did you notice an increased number of cells biopsied with the flick method? And do you have any mosaic results with this method? Yeah. So we know that multiple people have done uh, laser first uh, flicking. So we're gonna make this a general question for everyone. Um, you can start with Tony and then maybe we can go through the panel again. Um, with the flick method, I find that I actually use fewer cells um, because I, you know, I usually don't laser it to collapse it. So I, I, I pull it into the pipette to get it to collapse. 
and I let it, you know, relax to, to pull, basically pulling the, the fluid out of the blastocele. And I don't, the, sam the, the example I used was one of my first biopsies, and it was a pretty large sample. I always say I get five to seven cells, but it's really hard to tell, I mean, be real honest, what is five and what is seven cells. Um, and the mosaics, uh, I, there's not any difference in the mosaicism. Our mosaicism is actually really low. Like it's, it's, it's really like less than 5% in, in our lab overall. Uh, do you have, uh, do we have any other experience with the flicking versus laser in the panel? Um, I use kind of a combo of both. So um, I'll hit it with the laser two or three times. Um, and then I take a pen, one of, uh, actually a heavy pen, and I uh, tap the holding apparatus on the biopsy side of the manipulator. Um, and I just tap it gently, and it just breaks apart and gives me a nice um, sample, sample size. And I'm a pretty aggressive biopsier. I probably take more cells than anyone in my lab at least, and uh, there's no difference in pregnancy rates or anything along those lines. But uh, yeah, I use a little combination of both, so. Uh, Sharon, have you had experience with flicking? Yeah, we don't, we don't do the uh, flick method. We make the hole in the zona at the blastocyst stage. Very good. Uh, Kristen? Um, we don't flick, but I think this is an example of people who have been doing this a really long time, who are really, really good at it, and they just are looking for something different to do. That's right. <laughs> Great. Um, Make it exciting. <laughs> a question for you guys regarding the uh, cryopreservation media. Are you guys using your own in-house media or it's all commercial? And I'll start all commercial for us. And Same. in fact, if so someone sends us something with f that was frozen on homemade stuff, we say, what's the closest commercially made stuff to thaw? Mm -hmm. Everyone yeah. the same? Yeah. Yep. We're all commercial. All commercial. Yeah, I, I don't ever want have to have to make it unless I absolutely have to. Yeah, I, I know some labs that don't use commercial. And that's why I was curious to know what's... Uh, um, uh, Brian, it's commercial. You're using commercial media. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see, I can see labs making warming media. It's pretty much a simple sucrose solution. So it's not, you know, that's not really something that is out of the realm of possibility. But I mean, other than that, it's it's mostly commercial. It's just easier. But we're too busy. Very good. And ICSI versus IVF. What's the percentage on the panel? How how often you guys are doing ICSI versus IVF? Uh, Kristen. Yeah, it's about 90 now. Sharon? Uh, for ICSI, maybe 60%. How, how much? About 60%. 60%. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're lower on the ICSI side. Okay. And you, Tony? We do all ICSI. I used to split cases, and um, we just do all 100% ICSI, all for the same reasons that Bill suggested. Very good. Uh, we have a poll uh, coming um, out right now. Uh, Riley, if you can release that results from the poll and then we can go to the next question. And Miriam, would you be, can you cover the poll for us? Um, so for the, um, the, the first poll question, it was, um, are you using in-house media for cryopreservation? And 81% people said, no, they're not. Um, the second question was, what method are you using for embryo selection? Um, the most popular answer was morphology. Um, and for the third question, um, would you be interested in a multi-center spent media research participation? 45% um, said maybe and 42% said yes. Um, and then the, for the fourth question, how comfortable are you operating during COVID-19? 57% um, said somewhat comfortable and 34% said uh, very comfortable. Very good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think we have seen a, a little change in, in the answers over time. Um, for example, uh, for COVID-19, um, we've seen a lot of people that were not very comfortable at the very beginning, and now we see a little bit higher rate of people that are comfortable, a little, little, little bit more comfortable. Um, I want to touch base on the, um, um, the embryo selection. And uh, 
Kristen, you've shown us the AI method to select or uh, select embryos, um, but also to predict outcome. Um, have you looked at without AI and with AI and how that compares? Well, I, th I, th I would say most of the time, it, the decision is, is pretty easy. Um, <coughs> we've not really compared the, uh, the difference now. Uh, most of the time, the decision is easy which embryo to pick because, um, you know, we have, we know for us, we always try to go with day five embryos, for example, um, and then kind of go for morphology. But if you're trying to go in between, uh, then we definitely will use the, the calculator tool. But I think it makes it nice to, um, to be able to have a conversation with the patients about it. Yeah. Do you guys see future in, in AI as far as a way to select uh, embryos for biopsy and choose the best? Uh, absolutely. I think that there will be more and more tools available. Um, as we've seen in other webinars, you know, the, the IVF meeting.com was a great, they had a great um, meeting on uh, artificial intelligence and the IVF lab and future uses. So um, they know far more about this topic than I do, but I would highly recommend that for anyone who's interested. Fantastic. Any other opinion in the panel about artificial intelligence and the, the, the potential use for it for embryo selection? Um, I personally think that, you know, as these technologies come out, uh, we should embrace them. Um, you know, a lot of us, a lot of the data that uh, Kristen uh, was, was talking about, we, you, you kind of lo looking at your own data, it, it will tell you some of that. But uh, as, as more and more big data comes out, we should embrace that, especially with embryo scopes. I think the more information we can, we can collect through that, really through collaborative efforts, we can really hone down on that and, um, and use that technology to help us. I, I would agree. I think this, you know, this is um, data that Alex started collecting, I believe in 2013, and this is our own data. So it can't necessarily be extrapolated for somebody else. And, and even for a patient within or between different cycles, the factors that derive the calculations are going to be different if they're BMI is different or their length of stimulation or the amount of medication. I mean, those are all factors that, like I said, there's 300 and something factors that go into this calculation. So it can't even be different for the individual patient from one cycle to the next. But I do agree with Tony that as we start to use these tools more and more and can do full collaborations, that it's going to be very powerful. Yeah, and I, I, I do think that uh, the, the AI will enable a, an embryologist to decide what embryo to biopsy. And maybe during the stimulation protocol, it will allow or help the physician to adjust the dose of mm -hmm. drug and all these decisions that lots of physicians use their memory and, and training, but, but, but the, the, the algorithms are more rational and data driven. So it could adjust those simulation in real time. Right, and when, you, when we first started, we always felt like, oh, when I mean first started like 30 years ago, not two years ago, but um, you know, more is better. And the idea was always getting more and more and more eggs. And I think we know now that that's not the case. Not only are they not necessarily better, but we know that we don't need that many. And if we can use these tools to determine what's the optimum number of eggs, and then hence go back, hopefully for the optimum stimulation for the patient with minimal risk. Very good. Uh, Miriam, I think we have uh, one or two more questions, if you can take them. Yes. Um, next question is, what is the group's feeling about the use of isolates versus hoods? The use of? Isolates versus hoods. Okay. You can hear me. Yes. Uh, your, your mic is a little low. But... Uh, I've, worked with, I've worked with both, and uh, if I had a choice, I'd much rather work in a a flow hood or, or a workstation, so to speak. Um, and nowadays you can control the speed of the fan and those types of things, but uh, you just have more room to work with. You're not, you know, you know confined to a, to a smaller space that an isolate gives. That's my two cents. Yeah, the temperature control of an isolate is great. 
but the workspace can be a bit limiting. So I, I do prefer to work in those as well. I think that uh, isolates are okay for the retrieval, but otherwise I prefer working in here. As I said in my video, you go into 10 IVF labs, there's 10 right ways to do IVF, but isolates yeah. are too short for me. I cannot make them tall enough. It's an orthopedic disaster, so. And oh, sure. I'm sorry, I, with you. I don't like them, yeah. When you're Italian and you talk with your hands, you need more room to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, Kim just made a comment um, on- He always uh, makes a comment. <laughs> Very good. Um, we have one more question on hatching, Miriam. Last question is, do you hatch on day three? Yes. I do not. I hatch at time of uh, biopsy. Very good. One um, more question about Spain. Uh, yeah, any other comments be before I switch topic? No? Um, spent media, do you guys think spent media is worth, um, you know, exploring and do your uh, you know, your, your uh, uh, current protocol of culturing, is it compatible with the media? I think it's the future. Yeah. I think it's another tool, another something we have in our tool bag. Once, once you make it usable and something real time and fast, it, it's something we could use uh, as a tool in the lab. Uh, yeah, and I also think that, you know, looking at spent media, um, from the drops, but also combining that with the time-lapse uh, morphokinetics. Um, I heard that like Embryoscope is, is working on a model um, in which they do individual embryo culture. Kristen? Yeah, I, I, it would be great. I'm not quite sure it's ready just yet, but I think it will be, and I do think it's the future. And then those flickers and suckers and lasers, I don't know what we're going to do all day long. <laughs> Right now, I think the highest correlation is in the 78 or so that we have seen. Mm -hmm. um, it's still not there. Um, we, we need to be at least in the 90, close to the 90 to, to kind of uh, be um, comfortable enough, I think. Um, but, in, but, but shouldn't it be different? I say again? But shouldn't it be different? Because you're getting, a, you're getting more, uh, DNA from the entire embryo versus a small, um, you know, cohort of cells. Yeah, well, you know, you are relying on some cell lysis to happen, uh, but also you are up against material contamination coming from cumulative cells. Um, so the amounts retrieved from the um, spit media is not, uh, it's less than a biopsy in, in terms of quantity. Um, but because the technology is so sensitive, the amplification is so sensitive, it can pick anything, including remaining DNA from cumulative cells. Um, whether that is a representation of the entire embryo, I think because of that limited amount of material, sometimes you have uh, missing chromosomes or uh, you have some discrepancy um, uh, compared to the biopsy or to the embryo, and, and the correlation is in the 70s, I think the challenge that we are facing is how do you get enough material, but also every time you, you take a sample from a spin media, not just occasionally. Um, so a way, one way to address that is to uh, do uh, uh, embryo collapsing or some minor lasering of the embryo so that you can enhance that um, DNA to leave the embryo uh, or leak out of the embryo while you're collecting the remaining DNA from spent media. Yeah. There are certain labs that are trying that. You, you can also do a, you know, a day three uh, changeover and then make a whole you know, donor and pull sort of the embryos out to blast. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, very good. Well, we have one more poll to release. Um, uh, Riley, if you can release the same poll, second poll. We're approaching the uh, uh, end of the webinar. 
I wanted to give you guys a, a before we do the introduction of uh, uh, each clinic, uh, just for the labs to get um, uh, uh, you know um, comfortable with with who is attending. I wanted to ask one more question on COVID nineteen. So we have had many webinars through the uh, last few weeks, um, and uh, the uh, every time we try to get data on where we are and how much we know about uh, sperm uh, in contamination and, and, and biopsy, uh, embryo contamination with COVID-19. Do we have anything new um, or do we have the same information we had three or two months ago? And I'll start with you, Kristen, and then maybe I'll go through the panel. I am not aware of any new papers that, that relate directly to this. Very good. Brian? We were talking about that before we started here. I did a quick PubMed search and couldn't really pull up anything that was uh, new or informative there. I agree. Yeah. Sharon? No. Okay, and uh, Tony? Um, I'm not aware of anything new. What has surprised me about COVID is how quickly the papers come out. And you know how they you know are they you know when they're peer reviewed and sometimes it takes months to get papers out and so we're we're learning as we are going and half the time I know that I'm making it up as I go you know, full full disclosure. Very good. Um, okay. Well, I think uh, according to um, the webinars we had. So far, and I think Kim is attending. He 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 may clarify that. I think all the research that we have seen in papers does don't suggest that um, uh, sperm cells have active receptors that will bind to COVID nineteen, or at least so there is not enough either evidence there. Uh, I think also from a clinical clinical perspective, there is no evidence of lateral um, uh, you know transfer of COVID from a mom to a baby. I think uh, uh, what we have seen so far is that uh, during pregnancy, there is a study that suggested my, uh, some lesions on the placenta, but no obvious impacts on deliveries. Uh, they looked at 16 pregnancies overall. I think that's the summary of what I can recall from the uh, COVID-19 lit literature. Um, very good. So let's look at the poll results. I think we just... Uh, ask the audience to give us some uh, feedback. We have uh, um, approximately more than 100 uh, embryologists. Uh, right now we have 81 participants, so that's the feedback we are getting. We asked them uh, if the webinar has clarified some doubts. It looks like 71% said yes, 27% said somewhat yes. Thank you so much for the help in clarifying some of the questions. And 98% uh, said they would like to see a webinar like this. Um, um, I would like to just have the last minute to let you guys introduce your organization. And with that, we're gonna wrap up the, uh, the webinar. And I'll start with you, Kristen. Um, we are a six physician group in the San Francisco Bay Area in the East Bay. Uh, we do about 3000 fresh and frozen cycles year. I've been here for uh, many, many, many years, as um, somebody pointed out by the poster in the back of my wall back there. Um, and just every time, learning something new, great to be here, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Brian? Uh, so I work with the World Egg Bank. We are a standalone egg bank. Uh, we do all of our procedures in-house. Uh, and we ship from the lab. Uh, I've personally vitrified every egg that's come through the bank since 2013. So um, our model is based on consistency. And we're in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Thank where you. It's hot. Thank you. Sharon? So I work for the uh, Mainline Fertility Center. Um, we're the largest center in Pennsylvania. And um, I guess that's, that's just about it. Uh, yeah, we have, I think, five satellites. Um, we just have a full services um, center. Fantastic. Uh, Bill? 
First, a shout out to Sharon. We are. <laughs> we are. From <laughs> um, we are San Diego Fertility Center. It's private practice, five physicians. We do about um, 1,200 uh, retrievables and about 1,400 FETs a year. That was pre-COVID. Um, got a team about, uh, or had a team about 10 embryologists. We're trying to rebuild that team uh, since uh, furloughs and layoffs because of COVID, but um, we're getting there. We did start batching, but uh, that doesn't work for us. So we're going to go back to uh, full-time starting um, in a month. Thank you so much. Tony? Um, and here in San Antonio, we're a three physician practice, uh, Aspire Fertility. We're part of the Prelude Network of IVF Labs. And uh, we do around uh, maybe 1,100 uh, uh, fresh retrievals and frozen transfers split between those. Very good. Well, thank you so much for your uh, contribution and for the amount of information we received from you guys. It really has been really a pleasure to see the labs from inside a very uh, interesting perspective. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for participating. And uh, so next week uh, on Wednesday, 3 p.m. Pacific time, we have another topic. We will update you with uh, the title and the participants in the next day or two. Thank you so much for coming and thanks for your time. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks to you and your team for hosting. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care, everyone.